In this video, we're going through the Queensland Maths General 2020 Multiple Choice. Uh, this is the external exam that all Queensland students did in 2020. Um, just going to go through these 15 questions. We're going to go through them relatively fast. I'm assuming here that you've done the study, you know some of this stuff. I'm reminding you and I'm showing you some little tricks along the way. All right, let's get started on question one. Question, question one, uh, four linear models have been developed for a data set. Identify the residual plot that indicates the developed linear model is justified. All right, so let's just talk for a minute about this residual plot idea. The dots here, like I have here, some data points. And if you're creating a residual plot, what you're doing is finding out how far above or how far below each dot is and you're measuring those distances and you're putting them on here how far above how far below now what you should expect is an equal or roughly equal number of dots above the line as below the line roughly an equal number of dots above and below uh, so that kind of cancels this one out can't be that one because they're all above the line that would make no sense that all the dots were above your line uh, now you should also expect Ones that are above and below the line are roughly scattered, not something like this where um, this one's very far below the line and then this one's closer and then this one's closer and then all of the future ones are above the line. That would lead to a graph that looks a little bit different. It's a little bit like this. You can see very far away, closer, closer, there, there, there. But this line is not a good fit for that. That line should have looked more like like that or something. So that's this one gone. Now I'm not going to bother drawing this one but for similar reasons this one's no good either. This one is our answer. Even numbers of things that are above and below the line and they're scattered. It's not the first half are below and the first half are above. The answer is C. We're talking about time zones. Now it says all states and territories except Western Australia Queensland and Northern Territory have daylight savings. All right, so that means that South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania have daylight savings. Okay, daylight savings time is one hour ahead of standard time. When it is 10 a.m. daylight saving time in New South Wales, what time is it in? Um, it looks like it's going to be Queensland and South Australia. So New South Wales is one hour ahead of Queensland. It doesn't matter with this GMT plus 10. All that tells us is that all these shaded ones here are all usually on the same time zone, but because New South Wales are one hour ahead, when it's 10 a.m. in New South Wales, it'll be 9 a.m. in Queensland. Now, if we look at our answers, that means it's not going to be that one, and it's not going to be that one. Okay, uh, South Australia is also on daylight savings time, so it moved its clocks forward when New South Wales did, um, but usually... See 9.5 here, 10 here, and South Australia is included in that 9.5. Usually they're half an hour behind New South Wales. So if they both move their clocks forwards, South Australia will still be half an hour behind New South Wales. New South Wales is at 10, South Australia is at 9.30. So we have 9.30 for South Australia, 9 a.m. for Queensland. Our answer here is A. This question's got a bit of a trick to it. Uh, for the sequence, this sequence, the common difference is. So common difference is the difference between each number. And you can see from 4 to 2, there's a difference of 2. From 2 to 0, there's a difference of 2, 2, and 2. Now, it's going to be very tempting at this point to say that the answer is B. But look at the sequence. It's moving down. The common difference isn't 2. The common difference is negative 2, negative 2, negative 2, negative 2. We're subtracting 2 from each term to get the next term. So it's not this. The answer is negative 2. Now, if you want like a formula, take this term and subtract that term and you'll get the common difference. So 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Start at the, the next term and subtract the previous term but really you should look at it and think is it going downwards or is it going upwards as which of the following could be modeled using a geometric sequence now you should know that arithmetic sequences are straight lines and you should know that geomet and arithmetic sequence could look like that a straight line upwards like that but it could also be a straight line down like that all right they are arithmetic sequences and 
and this one is an arithmetic sequence because it's a straight line. So we can get rid of that one. The rest of them look like they might have something to do with a geometric sequence, but you should know that geometric sequences look one of two ways. They have this rough shape, what we call an exponential growth curve there. Uh, think like interest rates. It should get a picture that looks something like this. Now, when we look here, I can't see anything that looks like that. It really needs to start there and move like that. You might think that looks like that, but it's got a downward thing as well. That's not what we're looking for. The other type of geometric sequence is what's called a decay curve, and that looks something like that. Should be a nice smooth curve there. And we do have a nice smooth curve here. So our answer here is D. For this one here, you should be reaching into your formula sheet and taking a look at your formula. We're looking at a least squares line. This is our formula sheet right here. So we're going to find our gradient here, R times SY over SX. Now there's our R value and SY is hiding here and SX is hiding here. So let's write that down. Put that into your calculator, you're going to get an answer of 16.79. Now that's our, our B value, that's our gradient. So our answer is going to be A or B, we just don't know which one yet. And for that, we're going to have to find our intercept, which is uh, Y bar minus B times X bar. Let's plug our numbers here, we have Y bar of 68.6, we have X bar of 5.2, and we have a B value, which we just found, of 16.79. When you type that into your calculator, you'll get an answer of negative 18.7, which brings our final answer to be a B value of 16.79 and our uh, A value of negative 18.7. Our answer is B. It's going to feel a bit tricky. Let's jump through it. A loan of $10,000 has interest charged at 6% per annum, but compounding quarterly. Okay, that's the first important part. Quarterly repayments of $700 the balance after six months. All right, now there's a lot of like weird different time periods in there that we need to think about. So if it's 6% per annum, but it's compounding quarterly, we can say that the interest per period, per period would be 6% divided by four, 0 0.06 divided by four, which is gonna be 0 0.015. All right, so that's an important amount. Um, now, it says quarterly repayments of $700 and the balance after six months. Six months is going to be two quarters. So our time period here, there's only two time periods that we're going to work with here. All right, so what have we got here? Zero, we owe $10,000. All right, now what about at time one? $10,000, but with some extra interest on top, 1.015. That'll increase that 10,000 by the amount of interest, but then we also make a repayment of $700, so minus $700, $1,450. Now at time two, we're gonna owe that $9,450 multiplied by our interest rate plus one, and then subtracting that 700 repayment again. $8,891.75, which is the answer B. Question seven, really straightforward, a minimum spanning tree. Um, there's a lot of different algorithms for doing this, but the tree's so small that you should be okay. I take my smallest connecting bit and I connect this to this. And then I use my next branch and I go, okay, smallest one, connect this to this. So I've used the three and I've used the four. Now P and Q and S and R are not connected at the moment and I connect them with something. Now all the others are five, so it doesn't matter what I connect them with, I can choose to connect them with this. And now I have a minimum spanning tree, all of the vertices are connected. Four plus five plus three is 12, and that is our answer. Fast one here as well, uh, scatter pot showing a linear association. That means that we can draw a straight line through it. That should be a straight line, but you get the idea. All right, choose the best description. All right, it's sloping downwards. That means that it's a negative association. So the answers must be B or D. 
And now we need to say, is it a strong association or a weak association? So you can see the dots are pretty close to the line. They're not like all scattered around here. So if they're pretty close to the line, we say it's a strong negative association. That's it. Reading to do here, but a relatively straightforward question. It is observed that as the number of ice blocks sold each month increases, the number of fans sold also increases. So if we were to draw a little dot plot and we have ice blocks here and we have fans on this one, as one increases, the other one increases. Now it might not be perfectly linear like that, but that's our rough idea. So what can we say? Um, well, we know that it's uh, positive. So positive causation or positive association. Uh, an increase in ice block sales causing an increase in fans? No. Causation means causing. One's not causing the other. They're just associated. Okay, so what we get is there is a positive association, an upward, um, a positive gradient. There is a positive association between the number of ice blocks sold and the number of fans sold. D. Done. The following graphs represent a time series plot with a three point moving average. Now remember, a three point moving average, you take three points and you average them out and you put the dot there, right? So a three point moving average, it looks like this. You take this value, this value, this value, and you average them and you put whatever that average is there. And then you take this value, this value, this value, you average them and you put it there. And so what you'll get is a dot here that averages those three, a dot here that averages those three, a dot here, a dot here, a dot here. So what we're looking for is a dot at every single point, except for at the first point and except for at the end point. So uh, I've got, this one has a dot here, a dot here, and a dot here. That's nowhere near, near enough. They think that a three point moving average is like three dots. This one, again, just three dots. There, there, and there. So it's not that one either. This one here has a dot at every three points. That's not it either. This is what we're looking for. A dot, this dot is the average of this, this, and this. This dot is the average of this, this, and this. This dot is the average of this, this, and this, and so on, and so on. D is our answer. So we're determining the adjacency matrix that represents this graph. So look at what the graph looks like. Very strange graph. Um, S, R, and Q, they're all joined to each other. And T is off here by itself. And that's really the key to at least getting some ideas here. Now, if T is off by itself, what can I get rid of? Well, he's not even included in this one. T is still part of the graph. Even if it's disconnected from the graph, it's still part of the graph. So it's not that one. Uh, now here you can see a line of zeros. That means T is not connected to Q, R, S, and it's not connected to itself either. That makes sense. So it could be this one. Maybe it's that one. Um, here we can see T is not connected to anything either. So it could be this one. Uh, it's definitely not that one. All right, so we've narrowed it down. Let's take a look. Q is connected to R and S. Let's see here. Q is connected to R and S. All right, let's see here. It says here that Q is connected to R and S two the two doesn't mean anything when we're dealing with an adjacency matrix of a unweighted graph we just use number one to show that q and r are connected so it's not that one either our answer here is b question 12 this is just an interpretation question so we're looking here uh, the greatest float time for a non-critical activity so float time is the amount of time that you can delay starting a project or sorry, starting an activity. Um, you can see that the earliest start time for this activity here is at time 10 in days, but the latest start time is time 12 in days, which means that there is a float time of two days for that activity. And that is our answer here. The greatest float time in this whole thing in fact, the only float time is on that activity, and it's two days. Question 13, uh, which of the following is a planar graph with five vertices and four faces? So the five vertices bit is pretty straightforward. One, two, three, four, five, maybe this one. One, two, three, four, five, maybe this one. One, two, three, four, five, maybe this one. One, two, three, four, not that one. Okay, four faces. Okay, let's see how many faces this one has. 
Uh, let's do this one first. Oh, that one's weird. It only has one face, okay? The face is like everything here. There's nothing enclosed, so there's no enclosed faces. There's just the outer face. All right, let's look at this one. This one looks like it could be a winner. One, two, three, four faces. A lot of people are going to circle B here, but they're wrong because the outer face has to be included as well. This one has five faces. No good, no good. Process of elimination tells me it's going to be this one, but let's check. Five vertices, one face, two face, three faces, and then the outer face here, four faces. My answer is A. A little bit of reading to do in this question. A sample of university staff and students was asked whether they preferred catching public transport or driving their own car to university. What percentage of university students prefer to drive their own car? Okay, so the percentage of students that prefer their own car will be equal to the number of students who prefer to drive their own car. Students drive their own car. It's this one here, 12. But the trick is in the denominator here. Um, what percentage of university students. That means you should only be considering university students. Now, how many students are there? Well, there's 48 students who catch public transport. There's 12 who drive their own car. So there's 60 students in total. And we have 12 out of 60 as our answer. Now, if you type 12 out of 60 as your into your calculator, you'll get 0 0.2, which is the same as 20%. Our answer here is C. Finally, question 15, a little bit of a thinker to finish off here. I haven't really seen something quite like this before. Uh, let's see. The graphs show the value of three different annuities over time. All right, remember, an annuity is where you put money in at regular intervals. Uh, and you can see a few things, right? They're going up like that. One's not going up as fast, and one's going even slower than that. Uh, now, I'll just label them. This is annuity one here. This is annuity two here. And this is annuity three here. Which of the following statements gives a plausible explanation for the different values? Okay, annuity one and annuity two have higher regular deposits than annuity three. All right, so you're putting in a regular amount. Maybe in annuity one, you're putting in $100. Annuity two is not growing as fast uh, as annuity one. So maybe you're only putting in $70. Annuity 3 is growing less again, so maybe you're only putting in $20 a week. Uh, annuity 1 and Annuity 2 have higher regular deposits. This seems really plausible to me, so I'm going to like put a question mark there and come back to it. Annuity 1 and Annuity 2 have shorter interest terms. Okay, if it had shorter interest terms, you can see all of the dots are happening at one, term 1, and then at term 2, and then at term 3, and then at term 4. These dots... They represent when the money came in and when the interest was paid. And you can see all of the dots on all of them. That's a terrible straight line. All the dots on all of them are lining up. So no one has a shorter interest term than anyone else. Boom, that's wrong. Annuity 2 and Annuity 3 have a, a lower... Sorry, annuity, annuity 2 and Annuity 3 have a lower initial value. Look, they're all starting here at the same amount, 500. No good. All right. Annuity 2 and Annuity 3 have higher interest rates than Annuity 1. Look at Annuity 1. By the time we get to like the seventh year, we've got 20, or seventh term, sorry, you have about $2,500. In Annuity 2 and Annuity 3, you have less money. You would expect that if you're putting money into a bank account and they're paying you interest, the one that has the higher interest rate um, should have the most money. Annuity 2 and Annuity 3 have higher interest rates. It doesn't look like it. It looks like they have lower interest rates. No good. All right, so being careful here, we've eliminated the three options that don't make sense. This one felt like it made sense. So question 15, answer is A. That's it. That's the 15 multiple choice questions. Um, it's really a mixture of doing some calculations, but also knowing your definitions, knowing your stuff, and being able to narrow down some of those choices that you know are wrong and then moving towards the correct answer through a process of elimination. All right, good luck and I'll see you in the next part.